In this video, I will talk about the sync to noise ratio in wireless communication. And this is something that we abbreviate as SNR. And it is the ratio between the received signal power and the noise power in the system. So in, first, to understand the received signal power, we need to start at the transmitted signal power, which is something entirely different. So every wireless device is transmitted with a particular power, and it's very different depending on what type of device it is. It might start from 1 milliwatt, uh, if you're using Bluetooth, for example, go up to 10 milliwatt or 100 milliwatt, and 100 is quite typical for a mobile phone, at least when it's rating at maximum power. And then it goes up all the way to 40 watt when we are looking at a major base station put in a tower somewhere. And since we have these huge differences in power from one milliwatt up to maybe 40 watt, we usually are writing these type of powers using decibel scale, using something called dBm. That is decibel of milliwatt. And that means that we take 10 times the logarithm with base 10 of the signal power that we're transmitting and divide that with one milliwatt. And that gives us some kind of reference power compared to one milliwatt. So if you have one milliwatt of power, well then the result becomes zero dBm. If you have 10 milliwatt, you get 10 dBm. If you have 100 milliwatt, you get uh, 20 dBm. And if you have 40 watt, you go all the way up to 46 dBm. When you transmit power from your device, it starts to spread out into the air at the speed of light, because this is electromagnetic waves. And the power is then spreading out as if you were blowing up a balloon, where the power lies on the surface of this balloon. And the larger the balloon is, the thinner the surface area is going to be. On the other hand, that also means that the power on this sphere becomes more and more spread out because it has a larger and larger area. And uh, if you have a so-called isotropic antenna, which we will consider in this video, then the power is equally spread on this surface. For example, if you are at the distance d from the transmit, antenna, then the surface area of a sphere will be 4 times pi times d square. So you take your transmit power and you divide it equally over this area. And if you then are going to receive power on another device, maybe a mobile phone, then you need to consider how large is the antenna in this device, because it will also be placed somewhere on this uh, big sphere. And how large it is compared to the entire sphere is what really matters in terms of understanding how much of the transmitted power that can be received at the receiving device. And typically we are considering isotropic antennas also for reception. And the size of an isotropic antenna depends on which wavelength we are communicating at. It's the wavelength to the power of 2 divided by 4 pi. And for example, if you have a 3 gigahertz carrier frequency, which is quite typical for wireless communications, then the wavelength is 10 centimeters or uh, 0.1 meters. And that means that the area of an isotropic antenna is around eight square centimeters. So it's a small thing. And that should be compared to a very large balloon where the transmit power lies. So if you take the ratio between these two different things, what you will see is that you get something that is a constant term, lambda square divided by 4 pi to the power of 2, and then you have 1 over d square. So the transmit power is spreading out with a distance in a squared manner. And very quickly, as you increase your distance, you get something that is very small here. And therefore, we also like to measure these things that we call the channel gain, in decibel scale. So you take the 10 log 10 of this channel gain, and then you get one constant term, and then you get the minus 20 times log 10 of the distance. So it's very quickly becomes something very small. So here's an example where I have considered three different frequencies. The line in the middle is the three gigahertz frequency that we talked about before. And if you are at a one meter distance, you have like a minus 45 decibel 
uh, channel gain. So that's a very small number. If you are then going to 10 meters, you have around minus 60 decibels a sound gain. That means that what you receive is only one out of one million parts of the transmitted power. And it continues to go down and down as you are moving further and further away. So every time you are moving 10 times further away, for example, from one meter to 10 meters or from 10 meters to 100 meters, you lose 20 decibel. Uh, so you are losing more and more of this transmitted power. And this is all assuming what we call free space propagation, where there's nothing at all in the world that is blocking the signals, for example. In reality, you might have walls that are uh, blocking and you need to penetrate with your waves and then you might lose 10 or 20 dB just for that. So that's also pull, pulling down the channel gain even further. And if you are going to a lower frequency like 1 gigahertz, the curve is going up. If you are going to a higher frequency like 30 gigahertz, the curve is going down. So you are losing more in channel gain. And that doesn't really mean that the propagation is any way different. It's just the fact that the smaller the wavelength is at higher frequencies, you get the smaller and smaller size of an isotropic antenna. The channel gain is apparently very, very small. And that means that we are only receiving a tiny, tiny fraction of the power that we transmitted. Still, the communication systems are obviously working because we have many operational wireless systems. So how is that possible? Well, it doesn't matter exactly what the absolute power level of the received signal is, but how large it is compared to the noise. And that is where the signal to noise ratio plays its important role. And the noise power is also incredibly small. You can compute it by taking the power spectral density of the noise measured in watt per hertz. And in room temperature, this is typically something like 10 to the power of minus 14.4 watt per hertz, which is a small number. And then you multiply that with the bandwidth, which might be, say, 10 megahertz in our system. So that's 10 to the power of 7. And you're still down at uh, very, very small numbers. And for that reason, we like to measure the noise variance in the dBm scale as well. So we just divide it with 1 milliwatt and we take the 10 log 10 out of it. And then a typical formula will be minus 174, uh, which is a constant term coming from the noise power spectral density, and then plus 10 log 10 of the bandwidth. The graph here is showing the signal to noise ratio as a function of distance. So if you are at one meter's distance, and you're communicating with a 10 megahertz of bandwidth and you transmit with one watt of power, you will have roughly 60 decibel SNR. So you have a 1 million times stronger signal than the noise. Then as you move further and further away, you are getting a lower and lower SNR. So every time you are multiplying your distance with the factor 10, you lose 20 dB in SNR. So if you go from 1 to 10 meters, you lose 20 dB. From 10 to 100 meters, you lose another 20 dB. So the curve is going downwards. And if you have a lower power, just the curves are moving downwards. And in reality, when we have other things that are blocking our way, in addition to just having this signal power spreading out, we will have even lower SNOS, and you can see in this figure here. So in summary, the signal to noise ratio is a transmitted power multiplied with the channel gain, which is a very small number, divided with the noise power, which is also a very small number. And the result is something that in real systems might lie somewhere between minus 10 decibel and say 40 decibels. So there's a large span of practical values for the same to noise ratio.